It's late afternoon on the east coast of Tasmania. A community is mobilising. This is going to become bigger than Ben Ho, I tell you, and uh, we, uh, we want to win this, and we don't want to destroy. This is one of the iconic coasts in the world. Not Australia, yeah. Yeah. but in the world. There are plans for an 80 hectare salmon farm to be installed in the waters surrounding this town. Now, smell. Uh, Anybody worried about smell? <laughs> the Tassel in their, in their general uh, spiel have said they're going to be open and transparent. There's no way known are they open and transparent. Uh, how would they feel if they... The people here are taking on corporate juggernaut Tassel, Australia's biggest salmon producer. Its plans for Tasmania's east coast have divided the state. Really divided for jobs and for way, actually what the um, fish farms do. You know, and they're a mess. They are a dead set mess. It's a potential disaster. The whole environmental issue is huge. Tazsal, an ASX-listed company, boasts an annual revenue of more than $430 million and rising. It's planning for 28 huge ocean cages filled with hundreds of thousands of fish year-round, out here in Oakhampton Bay, opposite the world heritage Maria Island. This is Mariah Island. As you can see, it's prone to some pretty wild weather, but it's also a place of pristine waters and an almost untouched shoreline. It's feared tons of fish waste and sediment set to be generated by Tassel's Oakhampton Bay Farm could drift here. sitting on the, on the bottom of the sea floor and it's just stationary, but you start disturbing that and you bring it to the surface when you dredge, that's a whole different thing because you resuspend it into the water column. So they haven't thought about how Back at the community meeting, locals believe Oakhampton Bay is just the beginning. 28 pence, no bloody way. They're going to be all out in Mercury Passage, all down the coast. So you can't tell me this infrastructure is for just 28 pence. No way. The people in this room suspect Tassel is secretly planning to extend out of Oakhampton Bay into the unspoiled waters of Mercury Passage. Do you believe Tassel when it says it has no plans to move into Mercury Passage? I don't believe a thing Tassel says. Don't believe a thing. Up and down Tasmania's coastline, big business has well and truly moved in. And Tassel has had the biggest impact on the landscape, owning more pens than any other company. Hi, Linda. Hi. Caro, you want to have a Four Corners yeah. ABC. Thanks nice for having us. You. You're welcome. Linda Sams is Tassel's Chief Sustainability Officer. Welcome to our Rookwood Road Hatchery, Caro. She's showing Four Corners the company's $50 million high-tech salmon hatchery. Put these really um, interesting booties on. Where life begins in a plastic tray. Oh, Caro, these are our um, just hatched uh, yolk sack fry. So we just see our eggs here are just starting to hatch. This is the oh album. Oh my goodness, look at that. Phase, yes. So what we have about 19,000 of these in every tray. And we, through selective breeding, we've actually um, been choosing salmon that do really well in Tasmanian conditions. We actually choose for the traits that we want. And so it's highly engineered. Well, I think it's like classic breeding. So this is the same process. The gender of every farmed salmon is female. The result of an intensive breeding program where the brood stock have been manipulated and can carry both testicles and ovaries. In this one hatchery alone, there are four million baby salmon. And here we have our start feed facility. So these are our little fish now that they've started to feed. 
Yeah, so we have a... Once the salmon are big enough, they're moved from the hatchery to these concrete tanks. On to even bigger indoor pens, before being taken out to one of Tassau's many marine farms. OK, so how clean and green is salmon farming, Linda? Well, I would say salmon farming is clean and green, though it's not a term that I like to use. I would say it's a responsibly farmed um, product, and I think we do it in an environmentally responsible way. But there are questions about how responsible the salmon farming industry has been with the environment. This is Macquarie Harbour, the birthplace of intensive salmon farming in Australia. Situated on the west coast of Tasmania, right next to a wilderness world heritage area. We're heading out to Macquarie Harbour, where the big three salmon companies, Fortuna, Huon and Tassel, have been growing salmon for the past 10 years. You wouldn't know it from looking at the surface of the water, and that's because the problem lies underneath. That's where the real damage has been done. The regulator, the EPA, has told Four Corners in the past year alone, 21,000 tonnes of fish feed has ended up in the harbour, creating massive areas of waste on the sea floor. OK, so this is Hell's Gate. Uh, this is one of the reasons why it is incredibly stupid to intensively farm salmon in Macquarie Harbour. Laura Kelly is the Strategic Director of Environment Tasmania, the state's premier environmental lobby. She says the salmon farming industry has damaged Macquarie Harbour, which drains through a narrow passage called Hell's Gates. And you can see how narrow it is. And um, wave energy from this tiny narrow opening uh, is what's being relied on to flush the faeces. Well, so basically this Macquarie Harbour is what now just full of poo? Full of faeces. Yeah. In May 2015, around 85,000 salmon belonging to Batuna suffocated to death on one day in Macquarie Harbour when the oxygen levels suddenly plummeted following a storm. How bad were the conditions? Look, I, I haven't seen conditions like this um, previously in, in any farm that I've looked at, so there, it really is a, an extreme event that we recorded, and that's almost unseen in, in salmon aquaculture elsewhere. Dr Tim Dempster studied the conditions in Macquarie Harbour in February 2016, recording alarming temperature spikes and dangerous declines in water oxygen levels in the middle of the harbour. At the point where they have oxygen levels this low, they are experiencing higher levels of stress. And how, how, it's, how does that manifest? What's happening? So they, they're swimming around with their mouths open to get more oxygen to flow across their gills. Uh, they're swimming more slowly. They're no longer feeding. They're not interested in feeding. And they're, they're, they're essentially in a, in a survival mode. Really, it's ill-advised to have more fish in the harbour going through these conditions. And after you came to those conclusions and provided this to the government, what did it do? The government increased the amount of fish in Macquarie Harbour by 1,500 tonnes. Can you make any sense of that? Based on, based on my work, it's perplexing to see that that decision was made. Hello. Hi, Caro. I'm Mark. Mark Ryan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thanks for having us. This is Mark Ryan the CEO of Tassel. All right. What does the science, your science and your data tell you about the health and suitability of Macquarie Harbour yeah, continuing well, forward? Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting at the moment, um, the government's got a, a cap on um, production around there. We, we're farming within that cap. Yeah, but what does your um, science cap? So we see that that is sustainable and our science tells us that it is a sustainable um, waterway, so we're we're pretty comfortable with what's happening in Macquarie Harbour from a fish health and a fish um, growth perspective. Taz Sal says everything is fine in Macquarie Harbour. I would have a totally different opinion to that. Your opinion is? My opinion is it's not fine. 
Frances Bender and her husband Peter are the directors of Huon Aquaculture, the second biggest salmon farming company in Tasmania. Tonight, Frances Bender is breaking industry ranks. What is the science telling you, Frances, about the state of Macquarie Harbour? The science is telling us that Macquarie Harbour is a harbour under stress. Macquarie Harbour is a harbour that can grow fish, can grow salmon, carefully. And the latest science, um, and there's now a plethora of papers, is actually showing that the harbour is under stress. Could the industry be heading for a catastrophe in Macquarie Harbour? Yes, it could be. For Hewans, Francis and Peter Bender, the plight of Macquarie Harbour has tarnished the reputation of the whole industry, bringing unwanted scrutiny. Four Corners doesn't come down unless the community is concerned. I get that. And that's really sad. I find that sad. I find it sad that I'm sitting here having this conversation with you. Because we shouldn't be. I would be happier if we just slid under your radar and you hadn't been here. But you're here. Francis and Peter Bender began farming salmon in their beloved home state of Tasmania 30 years ago. I grew up just here in this area. I've spent my entire life in these waterways and I can't help but personalise it when people say that we're damaging this environment and this is our special place so we're not ever going to be in a position where we're going to damage our special family place. From humble beginnings, Hewan is now a publicly listed company with an annual revenue of more than $230 million, accounting for around 35% of Australia's salmon market, making the Benders one of Tasmania's greatest homegrown success stories. I'm the salmon queen, um, uh, whether I like it or not, so yeah. <laughs> it's, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Okay. So what would be the market value of the stock you have here? A lot. <laughs> Worried about the state of Macquarie Harbour, Francis and Peter Bender have made a radical decision. So what are we looking at here? They're scaling down their operations there and moving offshore, further out to sea, to more sustainable waters. Is that because the water's a bit cooler at this time of the year? Well... You're thinking of future ways. What do you think then of companies who aren't? Frustration. That's honest. Frustrated. We're all frustrated. Um, and my comments will be controversial. But the simple fact of the matter is we've been here for 30 years. We want to be here for the next 30 years. Have you communicated your concerns about Macquarie Harbour to the government? Yes, we have. We've been communicating with the government fairly constantly and whenever we have any new information since 2013. In 2014, Hewan and the smallest salmon farming company, Petuna, wrote this confidential email to the Tasmanian government. In it, the two companies express concern about the health of Macquarie Harbour that TASSAL have showed complete disregard for environmental and fish health warning signs. The scathing letter was leaked to the Greens, sparking a 2015 Senate inquiry into the regulation of the salmon farming industry. After that email, that September 2014 email was leaked, did you cop any flack? Yes, we did, yeah. So what sort of criticism or blowback were you receiving? That we would, damage, we would be damaging the reputation of the industry and those around it. And yet that's actually the one thing that we were trying to protect. Um, that's the irony of it, and we still are. In addition to criticism from industry, did you also receive criticism from the government? Indirectly, yes. Yeah. What does that mean, indirectly? 
from advisors rather than ministers. And what did the advisors advise you? That we needed to all work together and we shouldn't be breaking ranks, I suppose. So it's not about breaking ranks and it's not about scoring points and it's not about, it's not about commercial benefit. It's about doing what's right. Francis Bender has told Four Corners Hewan has confidentially briefed the government about its concerns regarding Macquarie Harbour on three separate occasions this year, to no avail. This is not the politically correct thing to say, and this is not the, the corporate thing to say, but it's, the, it's me saying it, and quite frankly, we're just sick of it. I'm sick of not sleeping at night because I'm worried about it. And I'm sick of people playing games. There's no need for it. We need to be honest, we need to cut back the number of fish and we can farm up there carefully. When it comes to Tazsal's farming operations, for this man, there were consequences. What did Tassel do to you, do to your life? Well, essentially, they, our business died and, um, cost me my business, my marriage, um, yeah, pretty much ruined us. In 2009, Warwick Haswell and his former wife took over a boutique mussel farm on the east coast of Tasmania, called Dover Bay Mussels. We used to boast we had the fastest growing mussels in Australia. Um, it was a profitable business. Several years of successful farming followed. Today, this is what remains of Dover Bay Mussels, an abandoned office, a disused yard. It was some of the most stressful, frustrating periods of my life. I remember one day driving back from Hobart and having to stop alongside the road and just burst into tears. I was just so wound up. It's still just below the surface, yeah. Mm. Warwick Haswell's mussel farm was located 150 metres from Tazsal's salmon pens. In 2014, the mussels stopped growing. In 2015, photos show them suffering significant gill damage, smothered in thick orange slime. Something in the water was destroying Warwick Haswell's farm. I realised that potentially the cause of our problems was coming from Tassel. When Tassel cleaned their nets, there's a big cloud of fragmented by you know, material that comes drifting down the water column and basically just goes straight through my farm, which is basically 10 metres deep uh, of mussels that are ingesting everything that's in the water as part of their normal feeding. With his business in ruins, Warwick Haswell made a submission to the 2015 Senate inquiry blaming Tazsal for the destruction of his mussel farm. Tazsal denied responsibility. I know our science proved the fact that um, we weren't responsible for any of his um, misfortunes. Despite its denial, Tazsal offered Warwick Hastwell a deal, a lump sum for his marine leases and his silence. In exchange for the money, Warwick Haswell agreed to never speak publicly about the matter again and to never speak disparagingly about Tassau. In addition to buying your leases, did they buy your silence? Ah, uh, yes. Why did you accept that? Uh, as a husband and wife um, business, uh, we were standing to lose a large amount of money and capital investment and we just couldn't afford to, to walk away from that much of a loss. Warwick Haswell accepted the deal, but he was still listed to give evidence at the Senate inquiry, prompting Tazsal to write this email to Warwick Haswell's lawyer. We remind your clients of their obligations not to make disparaging statements, whether in relation to the Senate inquiry or to the media or otherwise. One day later, Tazsal wrote again, attempting to withdraw the deal completely because it may be construed as contravening Senate inquiry rules. What did you decide to do? To not appear at the Senate inquiry. 
the cost would have been too great. How does that make you feel? Sick. Disgusted. Hmm. I would have loved to be financially in the position to say, stuff it. Does it feel good talking about it now? Yes. Yep. Why? Um, it's a burden I carry. On the day he was due to appear at the Senate inquiry, Warwick Haswell was nowhere to be seen. OK, we're good to go. Just for the information of the people in the room, we were to move to uh, Mr Warwick Hestwell from Dover Bay Muscles. He's unable to be here this afternoon, so we're now moving to... Do you believe that you were prevented or coerced from giving evidence at the inquiry? Yes. Do you have the material to back that up? Yes, I do. Hmm. In what form is that? I have copies of emails and letters from withdrawing the offer because of it could be construed I think they'd woken up to the fact that what they were doing was essentially illegal. And they thought they'd better try and get out of it. But as I said, you know, we, we'd already accepted the deal. Yep. Sorry, did that agreement prevent Warwick Haswell? From we put Warwick Haswell's claims to TASSAL's CEO, Mark Ryan. Did TASSAL in any way deter Warwick Haswell or advise Warwick Haswell away from giving evidence at the Senate inquiry? Well, there, there, there was a confidentiality deed um, put in place, Caro, so, you know, like, he was limited to what he could... Um, what he could say. So, again, if he wanted to front a Senate in inquiry, then as long as he didn't talk about confidential um, information as part of that, that deed, then, you know, I can't stop people from doing um, things in life. Warwick Haswell has decided to break his silence, defying the confidentiality agreement to speak to Four Corners. Why are you speaking up now? I had a discussion with my um, now ex-wife and um, we basically went stuff them. We, we've lost everything, pretty much. What are they going to do? What, what more are they going to take from us? In glossy corporate videos, Tazsal spruiks its sustainability credentials. It's been certified by the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. ASC, which stands for the Aquaculture Stewardship Council standard, really for us, it was the gold standard to achieve as a salmon farming company. Tazsal has also partnered with the ASC's co-founder, the World Wildlife Fund Australia. TASSEL uh, has come a long way over the last number of years working with WWF. It gives them social licence to operate within a marine environment. TASSEL is the only company in Australia able to use both the ASC and the WWF logos, proudly emblazoned on its packs of salmon. Does it give you a market edge? Oh, I think it has given us a, a market um, edge in terms of, you know, being able to, again, prove your sustainability credentials. So is TASSAL sustainable and transparent? Yeah, I, I, I think and I believe that we, we are. And I guess we're transparent in our um, practices. Um, we've got the um, Aquaculture Stewardship Council um, certification across all our farm sites. We're the first company in, in salmon globally to to have that, we've got the partnership with WWF um, Australia, which is really important for us. Do people trust WWF, that logo? Do you think that's what it engenders in the consumer? We have a, a high degree of trust in the Australian market, as we do globally. Just to be clear on record... Dermot O'Gorman is the CEO of the World Wildlife Fund Australia. What does that assure consumers when it comes to that logo being on TASSAL products? So the idea of linking the WF logo to ASEs to assure Australian consumers that the product they're buying is a responsibly sourced salmon. But clear and simple. Four Corners has received a copy of TASSAL's partnership agreement with WWF a contract signed by Dermot O'Gorman and Mark Ryan in May 2016. 
It shows. Tassel pays WWF almost a quarter of a million dollars every year for three years, plus bonus performance payments to be able to use the Panda logo. We've also discovered Tassel forks out another quarter of a million dollars every year to cover the costs of its ASC accreditation. How can consumers have confidence in the use of that WWF logo if in fact Tassel have paid for them, have bought them? They have contributed to our conservation work. If you're trying to imply that that in some ways compromises the credibility of iBrand, I have to beg to disagree. Well, I'm not implying, we, I'm asking. Oh yeah, so we maintain the highest scientific standards in terms of how we go into partnership with, with companies. And we have ASC, which is the gold standard in sustainable salmon farming, that we believe sets the, that standard both here in Tasmania and around the world. Mark, if Tassel is transparent, why haven't you published this fee schedule to WWF? Well, I'm not sure what the relevancy of um, the fee schedule is. It's the first time anyone's bought something up on it, um, Caro. So if it is something of um, particular interest to people, we have no problem doing that. And if it, if it made you happy, I'd be more than happy to actually put that on the, on the website. In a preemptive move, one week before we were due to go to air, Tassau lodged this seven-page letter on the Australian Stock Exchange website. In it, Tassel says it has now agreed to be fully transparent about all of these payments. Do you know how much Tassau pays WWF annually to use that logo? I have no idea. WWF uh, charges Tassel $250,000. Well, they got a good deal then, didn't they? Then what do you think? Hewan's Frances Bender has her own story with WWF Australia, approaching the organisation three times since 2013 to form a partnership. Frances, how much was WWF asking for in money terms to enter a partnership with you? It was a figure between three to four hundred thousand dollars. Up to $400,000. Yes. Is it genuine? This but there was a catch. We could achieve a partnership, but we couldn't use their logo and we couldn't tell anybody that we had the partnership. Um, it was highly unusual, but there was nothing we could do about it. So I directed my staff to walk away from that um, partnership. Um, you mentioned before... We asked the World Wildlife Fund about its dealings with Huon. Has WWF been approached or in discussions with Huon about Huon using the WWF logo? We have not talked to Huon about the use of the WWF logo on their products. Why would the CEO of WWF say that? I don't really know. Um, whether he's not aware, um, but I'm sure that he would be. There wouldn't be many companies approaching WWF Australia to, to investigate partnerships. If he's not aware, he should have been. So um, it's disappointing. There's something else Tassel and the rest of the industry isn't reporting, isn't required to tell consumers about the salmon it's selling us. There's a, a very strong smell in here. Um, what am I smelling? Like anything that you manufacture for consumption, the raw materials uh, that go into fish feed do have a smell associated with them. You'd probably know... Marketing manager Leo Nankervis is taking us on a tour of the country's biggest supplier of fish feed, Scretting. We produce feed for the three big... Um, salmon producers for Tassel, Huon and Petuna. OK. The companies buy thousands of tonnes of these pellets every year. But what exactly is in them? And ruminant protein. What's ruminant protein? Contains on they contain ruminant protein. That's a very interesting question. I'm not aware of what ruminant protein may be in these feeds. OK. Do you think it's a 
it's a good idea to be open and upfront and transparent about what's in feed. Absolutely, and that's why I like the opportunity to talk to you today. Okay. We'll go up and uh, into the control room, which is... It may surprise you to learn exactly what is in Scritting's fish feed. I'm not 100% sure of that. A concoction of compressed chicken feathers, animal offcuts, lamb, beef, organs, blood, among other things. All right, we talked about the pigment earlier. And then there's this. This is the pigment right here, astaxanthin. Now, oh, this it's... is astaxanthin. OK, so this is a chemical. It's a chemical. It's also a, well, everything is a chemical, I have to say, that uh, vitamins and minerals are chemicals, that we, we are just a bunch of chemicals, really. It is identical to the chemical structure of the astaxanthin that the fish would normally get, that the salmon would normally get from crustaceans in the wild. Um, but this is actually a synthetic source, so it's a synthesised, nature-identical chemical. The synthetic astaxanthin being used is a closely guarded industry secret. We've managed to get our hands on one of these. It looks like a colour chart for paints, something you'd pick up from a hardware store. It's actually a Salmo fan. This is the range of pigments salmon companies can choose to artificially colour the salmon's flesh. Without this artificial additive, the salmon that you're eating would look very different. What but colour it, would, the, would the flesh be without astaxanthin? It would be more or less indistinguishable from other white fleshed fish. It would be white? Really? Yeah. Yes. Not, not a greyish colour? Well, it's very open to interpretation what's white and what's a greyish colour. If a consumer were to see a salmon fillet that was a pale grey or a white, chances are they wouldn't buy it. This one is a, it's pale, and the, where the wild is a vibrant mm -hmm. uh, orange. Mm -hmm. In the US, not disclosing the fact that farm salmon is artificially coloured landed the three biggest supermarket chains in court sued by consumers in a class action. Colour added, what does that mean? People were upset, people were furious, they didn't know what they were eating, they were being deceived, and that really drove us to, to bring the lawsuit. How then did the supermarkets respond to the claim when it was filed? Well, when we filed the claim, within a week or two, the supermarkets committed to start labeling their salmon. And it was a remarkable victory right after filing the lawsuit without much litigation. Yes. I want to buy some of that. Yes, sir. One pound center cut. Yes, sir. In America, truth in labeling matters. Here in San Francisco, consumers demand to know what they're eating so that they can make a choice. So Okay, would you buy the, the farm fish? Which no, is... I would never buy farm fish. Why? Because they're chemically treated. I don't know what they put in them. I can't trust who makes them. I would tell Australians to get educated and get informed about what they're actually consuming and buying. You know, now that they know that it's farm salmon, they should look into it. <laughs> Back in Tasmania, concerns about the salmon farming industry are growing. Tassal is planning to expand into new waters on the east coast to install 28 giant salmon pens here in the pristine Oakhampton Bay. How would you characterise Tassal's proposal and its plans for Oakhampton Bay? I suspect it's going to be shown to be environmental vandalism. It's as I've been said, the scale of what they're proposing to do there is scary. Rowan Armitage used to own the Oakhampton Bay water lease, pictured here 16 years ago. He was planning to use it to farm salmon year round. But following detailed scientific studies, he determined it couldn't be done. The current was too low, and in summer, the water was too warm. As water temperature goes up, the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water goes down. If you don't have any oxygen, you don't have any fish. 
Based on the science, Rowan Armitage ruled out year-round salmon farming in Oakhampton Bay. A former industry man, he's now pleading for the regulator, the EPA, to listen. Well, I think the EPA has to, excuse the expression, grow some balls and um, take control of what's going on. Um, they've got to man up and, and start putting some sensible controls in place um, to save another Macquarie Harbour happening on the east coast. This is the area at the heart of Tassel's controversial expansion plan, Oakhampton Bay. Further south is the pristine Mercury Passage. Both of the water leases you see here are owned by a company called Spring Bay Seafoods. Hi, I'm Caro from Point Corners. Phil, Phil, nice to meet Likewise. you. Yep. Thank you for having us. Pleasure. This is, yep. So this is Spring Bay Seafoods. Yeah, yeah. You've come in with all guns blazing by the looks of it. Phil Lamb is the managing director of Spring Bay Seafoods, one of Australia's most awarded mussel producers. But his farm has come to a standstill. A toxic algal bloom has wiped out all his mussels. We were four months last year with closures, and um, this year it's, uh, where are we now, two and a half months, yeah, so no income. Mm. How are you coping? Oh, managing, yeah, we'll get there. We've got a few things in the wind, so, which is what we're here to talk about, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I presume that's with the... Phil Lamb's company has recently subleased a large chunk of its Oakhampton Bay farm to Tassel. Well, I've got a group of locals here as well. So they've come along to speak with Four Corners or...? Yeah, yeah, well, they, they've come along to support us, I suppose, in what we're doing and what Tessel's wanting to do. Yeah. OK, so we've got, so, a, we've got a lot of people here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, the people who've decided to come and see us today are powerful figures in the local community, business owners, even mayors. And, and I take it everybody here in the room is... is Pro Tassel's expansion yeah. into mm -hmm. your region. Yes, correct. Why is that? The locals are desperate for jobs. The youth unemployment rate here is well above the national average. Almost 20% are out of work. We're just crying out for help. Crying out uh, for help. Crying out for a uh, new industry in this area. Yeah, so it's just, uh, it has to happen. We're not only getting new industry, we're getting a world-class industry, a world-credited industry, and we've got an opportunity here to show the world what Tasmania can do, or they actually are doing it now, Tasel. Why wouldn't you want it? But this is no ordinary get-together. A really important question. Almost all of the people in this room had been put forward by Tasel to be interviewed by Four Corners. Several days earlier, we were leaked a series of confidential documents from inside Tassel. In the first document, Tassel's plans for dealing with Four Corners and controlling the message are laid bare. The bottom line is the industry must work together as Four Corners will try to divide and conquer. It's important that the industry players find common ground and appear united. It also revealed Tassel was tracking our movements. Our interviews and interactions with others were being recorded without our knowledge and privately shared with Tassel. Then there's this. The industry must organise third-party stakeholders, provide support, offering a neutralising action. And I think some people believe what they want to believe and if Tassel said the sun will come up tomorrow, they wouldn't believe it. So there's just that element of people who won't believe anything they say. We were leaked a second document from inside Tassel, a Four Corners strategy manual. Spanning 50 pages, it lays out how Tassel has contacted dozens of community members, business owners, mayors, even approached supposedly independent organisations. The World Wildlife Fund, the CSIRO, the EPA, the Tasmanian Department of Premier and Cabinet, state and federal politicians to support and promote Tassel's expansion plan. That plan hinges on using Phil Lamb's Oakhampton Bay water lease. Tassel have done the homework, we've done our own homework, but Tassel are the experts, we've leased the water to them and they're confident um, that it's suitable. 
Yeah. The locals here That's might support Tassel's plans for Oakhampton Bay, but they're dead against the rumoured expansion into the Mercury Passage. I'd, no. be, I'd be tied to the front of the boat stopping them. No, it's too important to the local people, it's too important to the fishing, the, the local fishermen and the, lo and the tourist industry, and they have no intention at all of going there anyway, I'm told. Tessal have quite openly stated... That Spring Bay Seafood's Phil Lamb assures everyone there's no truth to the rumours. And yeah. now in front of the, this group of locals and business owners, you can say to them, no, that rumour is Ab not true? Absolutely, I think they all know that. Um, yeah, yeah um, it's, it's, it's another one of these myths that's floating around. No worries, Bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 After the meeting wrapped up, we asked Phil Lamb again about Tassel's rumoured intentions to farm salmon in his Mercury Passage lease, known as Lease 164. On the record, there is no option over Lease 164 in, in Mercury Passage. Have there been any previous agreements that you have been a party to about Tassel fish farming in 164? There's no agreement, previous or existing, for farming um, in, in farming salmon in lease 164. Absolutely not. So there's never been any agreements, past, present, future, to farm salmon in Mercury Passage? No, that, that, that's true, Carrie, and we had the discussions, as we said, early days to determine whether we would want to and we determined very early that no, we wouldn't and there's no agreements in place to farm um, salmon there. Four Corners has obtained this document, titled Heads of Agreement. It details discussions about the possibility of commercial Atlantic salmon farming in the Mercury Passage. Signed in June 2014 by Phil Lamb and Tassel CEO Mark Ryan. Yes, we did look at Mercury Passage early days to determine its sustainability, but we determined on a, on a social licence, a community perspective, that no, that's not something that we want to, want to entertain. So quickly we when didn't... When did you rule it out? Oh, we probably ruled it out about two years a, ago when we actually had a look at it, saw where it was located and and the like. But this second document, obtained by Four Corners, reveals the opportunity remains open. A draft contract, dated 2016, but unsigned, it reads, should Tassel wish to expand in the Mercury Passage, Spring Bay Seafoods will facilitate this expansion. Can you assure the public that Tassel has no plans no plans to exercise any options about entering Mercury Passage to farm salmon in the future? Yeah, I can put that on record that we have no plans to farm salmon in Mercury um, Passage where that existing lease is at the moment, nor outside of that lease. The big business of salmon farming is now at a crossroads. The community and the industry is divided. One company leader is pleading for change before it's too late. We have an amazingly great industry. It's come from nothing. Sorry. It's come from not existing to getting to a point now where we're the largest agribusiness in this state and we employ so many fantastic people in areas where there's no work. And we want to risk that. I just don't understand it. 